and I see this all the time, is people who get three out of four trades right, and then they're down money because they got their confidence level was too big, their positions got too big, and then the fourth position hurt them. Or the fourth position wasn't scaled to the what is the downside versus the upside. And so I always say, make a little bit of money a lot of times, make a lot of relative value decisions. So, you know, this idea of don't get overconfident, don't have one business, even though it's working, you know, don't get overconfident. And I see it all the time. Hi, folks. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome today's guest, Rick Reader, who's one of the world's most important investors. Rick is responsible for about $2.6 trillion in assets at BlackRock, which is itself the world's largest asset manager. He also recently won Morningstar's 2023 award for Outstanding Portfolio Manager. So Rick, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. It's fun. I, I also want to point out, Rick just dialed in from an airport, I think in Atlanta, where he's stopping off. And can you explain to us what you did over the last few minutes, Rick? Because it gives a good insight into <laughs> context in which we're having this conversation and also your personality. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, part of my personality is I can't sit still and I do a bunch of things at once. And, uh, and uh, my wife doesn't really love that at dinner when I've got the phone out all the time doing 12 different things. But no, I'm, uh, I, you know, we're Markets are moving quite a bit and yield curves moving quite a bit. So anyway, I'm just involved in a, what is a curve flattener trade that I'm uh, putting on that, um, you know, long end of the yield curve is doing extremely well. And uh, so anyway, we're reducing some of long end exposure to buy some more in what we call the belly of the yield curve. So um, I don't know why I'm trying to, trying to execute that, you know, as, as usual while doing something else. So what's funny is that before we started, you usually I, I I did with Rick what I usually do with all of our guests, which is I I kind of explain some of the ground rules and I say, look, if uh, if if suddenly something happens, like your kid calls or you have to go trade pork bellies or something, it's not a disaster for us to stop. And Rick was the first guest I've ever had who said, actually, it would be great if I could just do a trade right now. So I had to sort of sit here quietly for a couple of minutes while you traded. So I, I thought that was a very nice insight into. Uh, into who you are. Into my persistent stress level for during when the mar when markets are open. Uh, yeah, exactly. We'll get to that later. So Rick also said for people who are watching the video, which is usually a minority, uh, is it okay if I keep one eye on the market while we're talking? So yeah. so my challenge is to keep Rick un, uh, <laughs> undistracted so that he can sort of, I, I guess it's to allow you both to trade simultaneously and to give us wise answers to, to my, my thorny questions. That was great. Only one eye, I promise. Okay. So Rick, I'd like to start by asking you about your very early formative experiences as a bond trader, which I, I think really shaped the type of investor you've become. And just to give our listeners a little bit of background, as, as I recall, you graduated from Wharton with an MBA back in 1987, and then joined EF Hutton as a trainee. And then as we might get to later, EF Hutton got absorbed into Lehman Brothers after Black Monday in 1987, when the market went kaput and EF Hutton demised, uh, if that's a word. Um, and so you ended up at Lehman working with a very important mentor named Bart McKay, McDade. Sorry. And I wonder if you could give us a sense of what that early period of working as a trader was like and what you learned from working with Bart, who, who was a, a, not that well known to a lot of our listeners, but was a very gifted trader who I think eventually went on to become uh, president and COO briefly of Lehman. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. And Bart, you know, Bart, you know, first of all, Bart became president too late and they, uh, yeah, I mean, I learned a ton. I mean, I, I got, I got super lucky. I mean, I, there were a couple of people in the training program, Fiat Hutton that came to Lehman and I was unbelievably fortunate to talk about nodes in your life that are, that are, you know, create a set of branches off of it. And, you know, I got to learn from somebody who I, you know, trained me quite a bit in terms of how to think about markets, how to think about, you know, research analysis. And, you know, one of the things I would say, a few, gosh, there's so many things that I learned from him and from uh, the team I work with. You know, I, I, and by the way, I lost a lot of money on a trade earlier in my career. And it taught me a ton about, and, you know, through, you know, Bart and others, you know, about how to manage the risk. And, and, you know, I, you know, I talk about this a lot, that we're not in the business of being right. We're in the business of generating return. And, um, you know, what I, what I learned at the time was, I thought I was right on a position and you usually do well in school. You're trying to do well in school by studying. I, I was convinced I was right. And I'd studied it and I knew the technicals, the fundamentals. You know, one of the other things I learned from Bart was reading indentures. You know, most people in the markets just look at tips of the waves and like to be in the hot sector. And, you know, I learned a lot about 
doing research, analyzing something, and if you analyze it more times than not, you're going to be you're going to be right because most people don't really study these indentures and go really deep and understand those. And this bond had a lot of convexity; had a call option. Anyway, I thought I was right. I kept buying it, and uh, and then all of a sudden I realized whether I was right or not. Markets didn't think I was right, and all of a sudden I started owning all of them. And you know, it doesn't matter whether you're right; you could be right six months hence or two years hence. You know, we're in the business of generating return, and if people think you're wrong and or you own them all, you're going to lose money. And so it taught me manage your sizing your position, take the loss when you need to. Don't double, you know, don't double, triple your position. You know, and I also believe in this idea. While that time wasn't necessarily the case, like make sure you do your research because ultimately, you know, I think you know the analysis you do are going to win out more times than not. Like I say, most people in this business, you know, look at you know want to chase momentum and chase you know chase whatever the hot thing is. Social, certainly with social media today, it's like I got to get on this train, I got to get on that train. So anyway, that taught me a lot. And you know, if I could say one last thing, sorry for being so long an answer. You know, I learned a lot about on podcast. Be long winded. Yeah, I think I appreciate that. You know, Bart, you know, I've learned a lot from people and, you know, Bart was one of these people, Corey Booker, somebody who I got to know early in my life, who was a, uh, you know, way you treat people and how you think about teams and your partnerships has really stayed with me for a long time. And Bart was somebody who treated everybody well, you know, was incredibly, um, what do I describe, the supportive of team of his teammates, et cetera, and, and liked to have the right quality of people, culture of people around them. Corey Booker learned the same thing. Like when I saw him outside of the outside of the public arena, I watched the way he, you know, I, 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 I sat on the board of uh, what's called North Star Schools. That was uh, one school, now 14 schools. And I watch how he treated people and dealt with, you know, and I, I watch how people treat with service people. Either they treat them with respect or they treat people the right way. And I learned a ton. And I think I'm a crazy fortunate. I have people that work with me that worked with me for 35 years, 30 years, 25 years, a bunch of people. And they, and, you know, I think it's, I think it's this idea of like, you can't do everything in markets, despite, like I said, being distracted. You need to have people who are really thoughtful about different ideas that are, you know, willing to challenge you. And, uh, I don't know, I, I, that would, to me, it was a really, really big deal. So we had a great team. And today, you know, I'm, unbelievably fortunate that uh, you know, I've worked with a ton of these people for for a long time. But th anyway, that that was that was a really big deal. I, I really think people underestimate like the quality of the person and what their intentions are. You know, this industry is a, you know made up a lot of people like are out for them, you know, out to make money for themselves and and fain of how do I make money fast? And and I don't know, I really believe in this idea of of uh, you know the right culture and the philosophy. And to go back to this very formative experience with this bond. I, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was a Canadian bond issued by Hydro yeah. Quebec, this utility yeah. company in Canada, I think was yielding more than 10%, something like that. So yeah. it looked very attractive. I mean, you were only about two years into your career as a trader, if I remember rightly. Why, yeah. why was it so traumatic? I mean, viscerally and emotionally, why, why is it helpful in a way to go through something like that in a way, like Ray Dalio's early experience, where he almost, and I know you and Ray are friends, where he almost destroyed his career and had to yeah. borrow 4,000 bucks, I think, from his dad. Yeah. Why are these early experiences that are just so searing, really formative in that way and kind of shape you for the rest of your career? Yeah. So by the way, I've learned this from tech, technology people, et cetera. It's almost a badge of honor to lose money early on or have a failure. And like I've been blown, you know, people like be confident, I, you know, I win, I win. Actually, it's actually the losses that, uh, that, you know, galvanize how you learn more and how you think about things differently. So uh, that, that bond was at the time, it was, it, I, know, I mean, you talk about emblazoned in my mind. It was Hydro Quebec 10 and three quarters of 6, 15, 10. I remember the maturity, the coupon, the whole thing. Because I mean, I, it, I mean, it really hurt me. But it, 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 uh, I don't know why, it really got me thinking about by the way, it was 6, 15, 10 with a, with a 1995, it's hard to believe this, 1995 call option. I'll show you how old I am. But, it, um, but anyway, it, you know, it got me you know, really thinking about, about things and how do I unwind this position and what are the technicals and how do I get out? And then the other thing was, you know, I had, I had developed some relationships on the client side and it also caught me, my clients can be really good partners with you. And so there are a couple of clients I called, <laughs> what am I doing wrong? And what do you think about this? And you know, and, they, and you know, they were varying levels. They were willing to buy some, and uh, and I was able to start to you know, people got a sense that there was distribution happening of this position. I started to work my way out of what was a deep hole, 
And, um, but anyway, I learned a ton from, uh, from, from taking that loss. And I, you know, I watched some of the most successful investors in the world and, uh, you know, it is usually, they usually had a tough, had a tough go at one point. And, um, I don't know, I, I truly think it changes the way you think you don't learn it. Like I, I don't remember the, the coupon immaturity of bonds that I traded 30 years ago that I made money on. <laughs> it's, it's the ones that cost me, uh, cost me a fortune. I remember you once also saying the geniuses don't necessarily make the best investors. And you saw this also with the guys from long-term capital management who blew up while you were at Lehman and you were having to deal with the, the, the impact of their unraveling. And it, it seems like part of what made this such a helpful lesson for you in terms of, of survival, which is a big part of what we'll talk about today, the importance of actually surviving as an investor. Um, it seems like part of what you learned was just the dangers of overconfidence. You know, I think it's, you know, the, the, you know, I used to, when I, early in my career, when I'd hire people, I was always blown away by resume and I was blown away. I didn't go, you know, I didn't go, I did, I guess I went to business school in Ivy league, but I didn't undergrad. And, uh, and I was always blown away by, boy, if somebody went to this school or that school, they must be incredible and de definitionally be, be a great investor trader. And then you realize there's something way more to it. Obviously intellectual acumen is, is pretty darn important, but there's also savvy, there's also how you communicate. There's also how you uh, partner with people and you work in, a, in an atmosphere. And so what I've watched over time is the smartest people become convinced they're right. And then they get similar to what I had, become convinced that they're right. So they build a position bigger and that the markets will figure out why they're so smart. And then they end up, end up hurting themselves or end up, end up, end up losing money. And, you know, I, so I, you know, and I've learned over my career, when I look at resumes and I look at people I hire, it's actually, I look more for a desire, an ability to succeed in whatever they attempt. And that could be anything as a swimmer, you know, as an artist or what have you, but that ability and that passion to, 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 to figure out how to, how to win and how to succeed. And, uh, and that, to, you know, cause people I've hired so many people in, into the wrong jobs, but if you hire them and they're, and they've have that knack for, uh, I don't know, sort of a street sense or like what it takes you know, either to work harder or to, or to or figure some out or understand the technicals, those people tend to do pretty well. And so, I, you know, I, to me, that that has become, again, you have to have a base level of intellectual acumen, which most people in the industry have. And then, you know, beyond that, it's, it's you know, a whole series of other things that I think, you know, make some of the great investors I've seen out there really good. Yeah. When I, when I was studying you over the last few days, it, it, it actually, it pushed me to look up a quote. Um, I, I hate to quote myself, but, but I was happy actually that I, it was a pretty good sentence that I, I looked up a quote in my book where I had this revelation where I was writing about some of these super intense, very successful investors. And I think I, I ended up writing something to the effect of so, sometimes the secret of success is nothing more mysterious than, an, than the unflagging fervency of a person's desire. And that struck me with you and the people you hire. There's this unflagging fervency in terms of the desire. Just it's almost like you can't bear not to not to succeed, or you almost can't bear to fail, to put it in a negative way. You know, I, I watch a lot of sports. And you know, you watch some of these athletes who are not always the necessarily the most gifted athletes, but they figure out, you know, they're whether they're crafty or they figure out like, you know, what is their opponent's Achilles heel or what is, you know, where is, you know, the opportunity side. And you watch teams that like win the Super Bowl, World Series, I'm like, wow, like, how did they do it? And it, by the way, oftentimes it was culture and it was, you know, the this orientation of, of teamwork that I think was a, uh, was really powerful. But I think, I say, I think it's such, such a big deal in terms of people that I find that are really, really good investors. Some of the people that I look up to that are, uh, you know, have that in incredible knack for, um, you know, for, th for figuring things out and, uh, and it's insatiable appetite and, you know, for figuring things out, you know, oftentimes I, I'm always blown away by people in this industry who've done really well and like, why don't they just retire? But there is, I think in a lot of those people that I have tons of respect for, you know, they, I think it's the intellectual pursuit and the challenge of, of, you know, trying to, trying to get it right. I, I saw a stat the other day that 50, uh, that the, 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 the top world tennis players only win 54% of the points that they play. I thought it was an incredible stat. Like, I was like, how could that be right? And then the more you think about it, it's similar to what we do is like, 
you just got to keep trying to get it right more often than not and just do it to multiply that as many times as you can. And I think there is this innate desire from a lot of the people I've respected that have been, you know, become great investors. It's just, you know, that, that it's an incredibly exciting and dynamic pursuit and, uh, you know, which I think motivates, motivates people. It's interesting because in some ways, when I, when I studied your early life, it seemed like you were a little bit of a slacker. You were a little bit lost and adrift. And I was reading about how, you know, you, you, you went to school, I think, not far from where I live now. You were, went to school in Scarsdale, I think, which is sort yes. of a posh place. And your parents, your yeah. parents were business people, although your father had lots of ups and downs. So, it, it, you know, so you were from a privileged family that then had tough times, I guess. Yeah. And you were at high school and you sort of didn't do very well. And then you went to Hobart College, which is not, you know, it's not Harvard, right? I mean, it's not like a, you were destined for greatness. And and you seem sort of a little bit lost in college. Can, yes, you, can you talk about the the moment when things turned around? When I I I remember hearing about your experiences where you suddenly were getting terrible grades and you were like, oh my God. T- tell us that story because I think it's a, yeah. it's a very interesting sort of yeah. turning point in your life in a way. Yeah. So my by the way, my dad, you know, it was interesting because we had, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of money. And then my dad did really well in this business. And it was it was an office products company called American Unifax. It was actually, I think his, his fraternity brother uh, uh, created Xerox. And, uh, and my dad, my, you know, it was, it was, it was typewriter ribbons and, and, um, you know, things that became correction fluid for, for, uh, typing, et cetera. Then it became, you know, quickly antiquated, but anyway, it was an up and down period, but, I, but, you know, that, you know, taught me a lot about innovation and technology and, and, uh, about, gosh, you gotta be cutting edge, you gotta be front footed about what they said. So that was, but, but, you know, your point about, I don't know. I did I didn't, you know, particularly in high school as you got into some of the classes in history and uh, you know, English literature and uh, and then on college, you know, philosophy, sociology. It's like I just didn't I, I a it didn't sink into me. I mean, it wasn't it didn't come naturally and I didn't so I wasn't intrigued by it. And you know, it's I, I found that, you know, you, you know, human uh human culture is really interesting in that you know, if something motivates you, you'll, you'll, uh, you know, you can re- you're really attach to it. And I mean, I, I actually, I think I took a typing class in high school. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then not knowing computers would be, so then accounting and I'm like, wow, I understood debit and credit. It was logical. It was intuitive to me. And then, and then I, you know, I, I transferred to Emory university and I took business classes and I, you know, I just, I think my parents were both entrepreneurs and, you know, I understood business. And to this day, I mean, I, I love looking at what drives cash flow and why do people spend on R&D or what drives employment trends and inventory levels? I don't know, but that all makes a ton of sense to me. But, you know, it's funny, like if you get on, and I said this in on some of the things I do with school, within the schools or analysts that we bring in, like if you get on the right train, like the human human being is pretty incredible around if you're motivated by something, your, your willingness and desire to work at it. You know, I've always said that, you know, like Sunday nights, I'm so pumped up. And uh, like I could, you know, get to, to go and do it again. And if you're motivated that way, as opposed to it's a job or you're motivated, but I, you know, I had a tough time early, you know, early on in, you know, academia that, um, by the way, I hope it's a great, you know, for Phil, for liberal arts, it was a great tool. In fact, one of my, my, my closest senior partners, you know, graduated there and he's extraordinary and he thinks of things in a big picture way that, that, um, you know, that is, you know, people can succeed from that. It just didn't, it didn't click in for me. So until I got, you know, the ball started, you know, the snowball started rolling downhill and something that I found intriguing. Um, yeah, I had a hard time being motivated. And it was something literally my roommate had, uh, we, we transferred together and my roommate, you know, said, you know, we gotta, we gotta move on. Like we, what we were doing was hanging out in the gym and in a night watching movies. And, and, uh, so anyway, he said, we, you know, we gotta move on. And so we, you know, he found the school Emory and, and, uh, you know, they business classes and I, you know, so I, and I don't know when I, when I had to like a, the, the trough of my grades, my freshman year, the middle of my freshman year. And I worried about my dad, my dad's reaction to it. The, um, I said, gosh, I got to change my life. But in a bunch of different ways, I was, you know, I always, you know, my weight was getting high. And, and so I know why it's like, it's amazing. how like something kicked in and, and then my ball started rolling downhill. So, uh, yeah, I no, have this was... great image of you that I think you 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 told once of of you kind of sitting on a rock on a golf yes, sir. in Scarsdale for about four hours, scared of going back and talking to your dad, and then <laughs> and then deciding, all right, I'm going to turn things around. Yes, sir. And that yeah, no, that was 
I don't know. I like, I've, you know, I don't know if people in their life have something, but that was, you talk about a catalyzing event. That was, uh, that was it. And I, it was it. And you really started, I mean, I sat there for a long time and just started thinking about life and thinking about, well, you know, what, where it was going. And, you know, thankfully my wife always talks about it. Like I went transfer I met my wife, you know, they had great kids and boy, thank God for, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't certainly encourage anybody to have really bad grades to create a catalyzing event, but, uh, it was a, certainly a motivating event for me. It somehow worked for you. And, and I, I think if I remember rightly, you came third in your, in your class at Emory and your wife came first a couple of years later. So, uh, she reminds me of that regularly. Uh, yeah. She's, she's the one we really ought to be investing with. Totally. hundred percent. hundred percent. She has more of a marketing, the more, more in finance, but, uh, but yeah, she clearly is smarter. So another, another important early experience that you had that relates to some of what we talked about, I think, was while you were at Wharton, where you had this uh, CEO from, I think, the Golden Nugget Casino come through. Can you talk about that? Because it also relates to this, to, really to the philosophy that you've had as an investor that stood you in very good stead for the last 35, 36 years. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean even, you know, I was in elementary school. You know, I'm a sports nut. I love, you know, I started like, I think, oh, this is probably date me, but I think I had like a 25 cents for my lunch, lunch money or, <laughs> and I used to bet it on, uh, oftentimes, which made me hungry at times, but, uh, bet it on chiefs Raiders game or what have you. And the, um, and, uh, you know, so I was always intrigued by taking risk and, and, uh, you know, and then by the way, I would do this research on like how they played on turf and the versus otherwise, I don't know. I, so, but then, um, you know, then somebody came in and spoke at Wharton, and I learned a ton at Wharton. I learned a lot about dealing with people and people from international uh, spheres. And and uh, anyway, but somebody came in and they spoke about, you know, what he said, well, how do we make money at casinos? You know, and I raised my hand and I said, well, the odds are in your favor. And I gave the, the, all the trap versus the statistics of what the odds. And he said, actually not. He said, people come, the odds aren't that much other than slot machines. People come with $200 in their pocket, and when they lose the 200 they leave. And, uh, and I, like, I kept resonating with me because what happens is you think about how, you know, similar to way markets, they, they oscillate up and down. And, um, and I thought about, gosh, when you oscillate, you hit the down, you hit the down 200, you leave. So almost, you know, statistically, you're always going to hit the down 200 if you stay there long enough. And more it hit me about, you know, about investing, it's like, there's going to be something exogenous, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's some like company's fraud or something. There's always going to be something exogenous going to have you hit the down button. And so I always try and think about what are, what are the things that prevent me from doing that? And then because markets oscillate, you know, try and be, I mean, it sounds cliche, but try and, you know, sell when, when it's going up and others are buying and vice, and vice versa, you know, take your profits along the way. But, but the big deal for me was thinking about, you know, markets tend to move in trends and they tend to move in trends around a, 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 a trend line, but they oscillate and, you know, based on noise and news, et cetera, but then just make sure you don't hit. And like, what are, what are your stop gaps around your, around your position? What are your hedges that, so that I don't want to be that person that, um, you know, that hits the, the down button, you know, particularly a minute, you know, clients, you know, I've had, like I said, I've taken losses over my career and, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that I, that I'm trying to insulate from that, but it, it, it's just emblazoned in my mind the philosophy around, you know, the random walk alongside of a trend and just make sure you're being thoughtful about optimizing it versus being on the wrong side of it. Yeah, it seems like a a, a huge part of your your process is or, or your success is simply this this a- avoidance of catastrophe. The fact that you've managed to stay in the game, whereas a lot of a, a lot of very talented traders, very talented investors have just blown themselves up. I, re- I remember you once saying you would watch a great trader who'd get three three bets right and then would blow themselves up on the fourth trade. Can can you talk about that? Like what I mean, what's what's happening just in human terms that people temperamentally, as as Ben Graham would say, we're our own worst enemy as as investors. So I'll say the first thing, I really don't regard myself when you say successful. Like I always think and part of what motivates me is I don't really regard, I, I think it's a constant challenge. Like I, you know, I look back and I say like, there are things I should have done or things that, like, I, I think part of what motivates people to, to, you know, not be in that where you, where you blow up. It's like, like, I don't, you know, I don't think I figured it out. Like, I don't think I, you know, I think, you know, I think we do some good things and you get some, you know, recognition for doing some good things, but 
you know, I think what happens is, and, and we st studied this in, uh, it was really cool. We did some things on, uh, to look at, you know, who succeeds. And it's interesting in, in, uh, in, in, in and it happens to be more in males that there is this, this dynamic around where you build a confidence level. And I'll never forget this study that showed tennis players. I'm not sure I talk about tennis. I prefer golf, but, but uh, tennis players, you know, when they, when they are set up, how men tend to try and go for it. And when they're ahead, they tend to go for it. And I see this all the time is people who get three out of four trades right. And then they're down money because they got their confidence level was too big. Their positions got too big. And then the fourth position hurt them. And or the fourth position wasn't scaled to the what is the downside versus the upside. And I think that is it's such a big deal is, you know, part of my philosophy around in fixed income, in bonds, bonds mature at par or they go down. And so I always say, make a little bit of money a lot of times, make a lot of relative value decisions, you know, try not to have that one trade blow up the three because, in, you know, in bonds, if you're wrong, they go down 80 points and you're hoping to get a par 100 cents on the dollar. So, you know, this idea of don't get overconfident, don't have one, because even though it's working, you know, don't get overconfident. And I see it all the time. I mean, all the time with investors, traders that, um, you know, you see the confidence levels growing. You know, I just had a good trade, another one, another one. And, uh, and then they end up getting, they, they end up getting hurt, but that, but I think it's a really big deal around investing or trading. I, I, I really want to emphasize for our listeners, the importance of that, that line that, um, Rick just mentioned, which is kind of, kind of a, a mantra or motto of his, which is let's make a little bit of money a lot of times, because it's so central to Rick's approach of really not so much swinging for the fences as diversifying thoughtfully, trying to survive, trying trying to get relatively consistent returns without huge downside. But in a way, it's curious to me, Rick, because it's sort of it's sort of the the opposite in some ways of the approach of someone like a Charlie Munger, who we've read about a lot in the last week and who I've interviewed in the past um, uh, and who just passed away a few days ago, because Charlie would talk about being a spear fisherman who would sit by the side of the stream and just wait for one big, fat, juicy salmon, and would then spear it and then go back to doing nothing. So in a way, he was a... He was a great advocate of, at, at least if you really know what you're doing, having a very concentrated approach where because you don't know that many things, you wait for something that's a really great opportunity. And otherwise, you just don't do that much. And you, in a way, I mean, there are so many different paths up the mountain, but I wonder if you could unpack for me the difference because there's something very different philosophically and temperamentally going on here that you embody. I'd say a couple of things. You know, the first one is I think I think equity and debt is and bonds are very very different. I believe in equity and similar to the, to, to the description you had in equities, you should concentrate more because they are convex to the upside. So you think about companies throw off return on equity, you know, whatever the numbers are, and particularly tech companies, venture companies. You know, you can if you're in the right zone, you can multiply your profits, multiply your revenues. And so in equities, I actually believe in concentration, scaling your positions the right way. And, and if you really believe in something, you can grow it. But bonds are different. And because of they are convex to the downside. So in bonds, I feel like this make a little bit of money a lot of times, diversify. But I like in equities, I actually like scaling. So some of the companies, you know, they're invested over the years that I really, really like, you know, including today. I mean, we take bigger positions. And I think, and not only take bigger positions, we use options to try and amplify the upside of it. So I think. I think that is that is one part of it. Second is, you know, I think it depends who you are and what your objectives are as well in terms of are you, you know, we're managing money for clients and, you know, whether it's policemen, firemen, teachers, et cetera. And, you know, I take it quite seriously that, you know, it's where their retirement, it's their well-being and, you know, this idea that I'm going to swing it and, um, you know, and, you know, what I'm trying to protect is, you know, grow their, you know, grow their retirement pool in a deliberate, efficient way, you know, without that, without that big downside. I mean, if you're managing your own money or you're managing your own, you know, whether your own specific, uh, you're willing to take risks because you're willing to take your own personal downside. I think that's a very different framework. I, you know, I also think a little bit different. Berkshire is a pretty unique place, but, uh, you know, it also depends on the scale that you're operating in. You know, we're, you know, we run a lot of assets and, you know, the scale, the idea of we're going to get out if we've made a big risky decision, you know, pretty darn hard. And, you know, I think, you know, if you're, if you're an insurance company, you have long dated liabilities, your holding period can be 20 years. We get measured, our clients, depending on who the clients are, we have some that are in very liquid funds 
you know, look at returns almost every day. And so, you know, do you have the ability to hold on for 20 years? So, you know, what is your investment objective? You know, I tend to think of most of our portfolios tend to think of things in six month increments. You know, it varies if it's a private investment, I've got a longer throw to it. If it's, you know, something like treasuries or duration, you know, I'm shorter. So it depends on, you know, who are you investing for? What's your objective set? How big is your, you know, what's your scaling? Is it debt versus equity? And so I think all of that goes into the equation. I think also what you just said about the ability to hold on is is really important. And I, I was very struck by a quote of yours that I'd read where you said, uh, I've always found when I've invested in credit or equities or anything, there are only three things that matter for investing. And they're yes, leverage, liquidity, and cash flow. And you talked about how if your leverage is high, but you've got plenty of liquidity and your cash flow is high, you're okay, you can survive. But so you said, it's all about how you can service my debt. And in a way, it goes back to that very early experience where you got blown up on that Canadian bond. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, I mean, I, by the way, it's quite an honor that you know, we learn these things and look at these things. So, you know, I think the, um, I think there's, I literally think there's only three things that matter, leverage, liquidity, cash flow. And, you know, I've learned that you can run a lot of leverage. And by the way, I think this is, a, this is an acute problem for the U.S. government today. You can run a lot of leverage as long as, as long as your cash flow exceed, as long as you have a liquidity, if it, if you run out of liquidity, it's over. And that, so you got to know deep down, you know, what is your liquidity and what can disrupt your liquidity because it's game over if that, so that is, so to put that aside, then it's your cash flow versus your leverage. You can run like U.S. government, you can run a lot of leverage as long as your cash flow, your red, your tax stream or your revenue stream is high enough and, and your cost of the debt is, you know, meaning your cash flow exceeds your costs of the, of the debts, so your cash flow is, is, is high. And, you know, I think for the U.S. government, it's a really big deal. If we're, if we're funding the country at five and a half percent, it's different than when we were funding at zero or one percent for a long time. So, and to me, that is the whole deal. And I look at everything, whether it's an equity, whether it's a bond, whether it's a piece of real estate, leverage, liquidity, cash flow. And, you know, it can, you know, in different forms, how much emphasis you put on each of them, that those are the three things on every single asset. I'm going to challenge people. Like, I can, I'm an illiterate not to. I, not that I necessarily have it figured out, but I, but I feel like I can put those that I can take everything and put and figure out those buckets, and then say you know even you know, it's a sophisticated tranched CLO uh, real estate securitization and you you know, you've got super senior down to equity and mes and like I just want to know those three metrics and then where are you in that in that um, the spectrum of are you at the top of the stack or the bottom of the stack in terms of how your cash flow gets to you, and I I, I don't know I'd feel really feel like you can isolate any investment that way. And uh, yeah. I remember it's a very naive. I mean, still pretty naive, but I was even more naive in my in my early twenties. My brother and I bought an apartment in New York because he wanted to be nearer to this girl he was dating, and um and I didn't want him to get rich without me, so. <laughs> I bought a small stake in the apartment and then it was the late eighties and the property market kind of collapsed. And we were so naive. We had an adjustable rate mortgage and interest rates went to something crazy. Like I think we were paying something 14% or something crazy. And I was a young writer. I didn't have much of an income. And I remember the terror of having lots of money going out and not that much money coming in. And I think in the same way as your early experience with the, the Canadian bond that went wrong, I just never wanted to be in a position ever again where I was caught short, where I was at risk of just finding. I, I, so, so I've just always lived within my means that I've never had much debt. And I, I think it was just such a that. So, so when I read you talking about um, just the importance of liquidity, it just deeply resonated with me personally, I think. So, you know, I, 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 I find it like I look at a lot of companies in venture space and, you know, in, they grow, you know, some of them are very pragmatic about how they grow and they, because they've got to, usually they burn a lot of cash because you're building the business. You got to spend on R on R and D and CapEx and hire people and you just got to grow. And you, and so oftentimes you see where they grow too fast and they're not managing their liquidity effectively enough. And you could have the greatest business model that will explode and, and, and then, and then it doesn't. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, something happened exogenous and your liquidity dries up and that this unbelievable business model goes, goes away. And I think it is, yeah, I think you have to understand that, that, that at, you know, when you think about it in real estate, like I've made some sales of, of uh, like you were describing, you know, early, early on where, 
you know, like the market went down and like, you know, I didn't have any money. And so you, uh, you know, like you got, you've got a seller, you've got to, you know, figure out something or you're, you're selling a price that you don't want to sell at. And so I, you know, I think you just got to make sure your liquidity, like that to me is the first thing. And, and, and every day we're looking at new investments and, and particularly when you're looking at equity or venture or more speculative investments and like, have they thought through contingent liquidity? You know, it didn't, you know, there's a lot of things you could do around bank revolvers and things about what is your contingent liquidity if X hits the fan? And uh, to me, that's such a big deal. I also think it's, it's, it's worth emphasizing the degree to which you've seen chaos on Wall Street and you've managed to survive and navigate it through a mixture of smarts and good fortune because you you joined and and there was a very significant amount of good fortune because you joined EF Hutton if I remember correctly in July 1987 and then October 1987 we had Black Monday and the Dow fell 22.6 percent in a day so this firm that had been founded in 1904 is suddenly forced into the arms of Lehman Brothers for less than a billion dollars so you then move to Lehman's training program and then you work at Lehman basically for the next 19 or so years and then you leave Lehman right before mm -hmm. Lehman goes under. And Lehman, this firm that was founded in 1850, suddenly implodes and is like the, the biggest bankruptcy in US history. And, and I, I think it went from basically being the fourth largest investment bank in the country with 25,000 employees, including a hell of a lot of really talented people, to suddenly just being gone in the blink of an eye. And I, I wonder if you could talk about what those experiences of actually seeing EF Hutton and Lehman, these two great kind of august institutions with plenty of flaws and pl plenty of human failures and, and the like, what impact that had on you in terms of understanding how, <laughs> how we live in a world of entropy where things fall apart? Hey, everyone. I just wanted to take a quick moment here to tell you about this premium superfood shake I have recently fell in love with called Kachava. Kachava is made from plant-based ingredients to power everything you do and help you feel amazing. In every serving, you get a balanced blend of superfoods, nutrients, plant-based protein, adaptogens, antioxidants, and so much more. As if that wasn't enough, Kachava also tastes amazing, and it's helped them earn tens of thousands of five-star reviews. It's creamy, smooth, and it comes in these five delicious flavors. To make it, all you have to do is add water and a little bit of ice with two heaping scoops of your favorite flavor. Then shake it or blend it and have it ready in seconds. Personally, I like to drink Kachava as a quick and easy breakfast or even as an afternoon snack when I'm craving something healthy to help me fuel my workday. I'd encourage you to give it a shot too because they have a love it guarantee, meaning that if you don't love it for any reason, you can just get your money back. We Study Billionaires is thrilled to partner with Kachava as they're offering our listeners 10% off for a limited time. Just go to kachava.com slash WSB. That's spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A and get 10% off your first order. That's kachava.com slash WSB. You know, and I mean, you said something that I think is, uh, people don't realize. I mean, it, it, you know, even at EF Hutton, I don't remember it that, that well. But I think about all the people at EF Hutton that have gone on to do some pretty incredible things today that are doing some pretty incredible things. People I was, you know, as a, just a trainee, you know, I was, and, you know, I've had a lot of respect for it. A lot of them just done incredibly well. And obviously Lehman the same, you know, you can have a business that's got an incredible number of talented people and, and innovators and, and, you know, thoughtful practitioners. And then, you know, you just got to think about, you know, the business model all the time and what is, you know, going to have to go back to that point again, but what is the business model? Are you managing your asset liability mix? Are you managing your contingent liquidity? You're managing for that, you know, very, very tail scenario. And I watch some of the companies, you know, that I think have been successful over the years that you know, have had, you know, tough experiences, but, you know, Apple's a pretty incredible and pretty incredible story. You know, they, where you watch about, you know, how Steve Jobs managed that, I mean, the failures out of, but then, it, but then he, you know, had different ways to manage it and how he raised in you know, Google as well and how they managed, you know, through some more stressful periods and, um, you know, you know, thought about, you've got to evolve, you got to innovate, you got to change and you, and you got to think about like, the same point about just don't let the business model in a, um, you know, or your structure, your capitalization, your lack of liquidity disrupt that. And, uh, yeah, no, it's a pretty, you know, even with the most talented people, um, 
you know, you can, you can certainly, if it's not structured the right way, you can have like epic disruption that end, that ends the game. It's also quite striking the degree to which luck plays a role, right? I mean, I, I remember Howard Marks once saying to me, he, it, it would sort of break his heart that he would see these people who got washed out at the age of 50, who were just really talented and they just got really unlucky with where they happened to be when things fell apart. Can, can you talk a bit about just luck? Because it, se it seems to have played a huge role in, in, in your life. And obviously you're dealing constantly with markets where things can just go, go against you that sort of undeservedly and can kind of hit you really painfully. You know, I'd say funny, you know, being lucky, I found is generally the, uh, you know, you usually put yourself hopefully in a position that, that is, you know, more designed that, that is not just based on fortune, but I've had some pretty bad, you know, I would say over my career, like you said, some things that have worked against that are just like surprising and bad luck or being, um, so, you know, but I think the only thing you can do is try and orient yourself in a place where that misfortune at a given point in time, you've, you've tried to anticipate in some way how you would manage, manage through it. But listen, I, I think, you know, I've always found like you see a lot of people in this industry who had like one good trade and they got, and I would say maybe a lot, some good work and a lot of luck. And then they try and replicate it over time. And they're like, it doesn't work the second time, the third time. And I found this with trades and investments, you know, usually if you have a great trade, and you're like, and then you think about, gosh, I remember that. That's, you know, that happened and I'm seeing that again. It usually, it never is successful a second time of the same amplitude that the first time. And usually it doesn't work. And so, you you know, you always, you know, think about, like, if, if you've done your work and you're trying to think about, like, there is, there's a series of environmental conditions that are probably completely different from the last time you did something that worked. And then just think through what are these new environmental conditions that can make that successful or, or not. But you know, it's, I'm pretty blown away by you see a lot of people that have the one big hit and then it's hard to replicate it. And then you see a very, very select few. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself in this. There are the very, very select few that seem to get a, get lucky on uh, on their positioning of their ideas more often. And I tend to think that they've, you know, through a lot of guile and work and, and you know, and thoughtful positioning got, got to that position. Well, well, we'll talk about this some more. Um, because I, I, I think a lot of, I, I, I want to talk about two things that I think have been really key to your su enduring success. One of which is sheer intensity and drive. And one of which is, is an obsession with data. Um, and it's, we could start with either of them because it seems to me they're both so central to why you have actually survived in this, in this business. I mean, part, part of it seems to be, um, I mean, I guess the good the good fortune that you ended up at BlackRock, right? Where you 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 set up this hedge fund in May '08, right? A credit hedge fund, right? Right before Lehman went under, and Lehman had a stake in it. BlackRock had a stake in it. So then you go with your team of about forty two when everything goes haywire in the in the bond market, and the the fund got clobbered. You go work at at, at BlackRock. So 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 you had enormous access to incredible amounts of data and human. Mm -hmm human mm. intelligence there. How, how is just the fact that you have enormous data resources really been kind of the, the, central, the central advantage, the central edge that you actually have these days? I mean, I, I mean, I think it's all about, I mean, part of what, you know, part of why I was so intrigued to come to BlackRock, I mean, we had a tough go and then, you know, then things were doing better in 09. And part of why I was so intrigued by coming to BlackRock is it, it was, at the time, I thought, you know, the epicenter could be the epicenter of finance, and um, you know, it's turned out to be more so than I, than I certainly would have anticipated. But you know, risk management tools, analytics, you know, we have a system called Aladdin that is pretty incredible. It allows me to stress test, scenario analyze, you know, look at return attribution, and like what daily, what's going right, what's going wrong, and that that data is extraordinary. And you know, your ability to like, you know, you can make some bad calls. I do make a lot of bad calls. As long as I know, because I've stressed it, I've looked at the scenario analysis, as long as I know what's my downside, how will it impact the rest of the portfolio? How does correlation work? So if I'm wrong on one thing, does it impact the other parts of the portfolio or will other parts suffer at the same time? Like that to me is like the whole gig. Like if you have, you know, this incredible, you know, anticipating, anticipating markets or the economy. So I, I'm a, I don't understand top-down investing. 
at all. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm very much bottoms up and meaning like I, you know, I study companies, like I like people follow surveys, I think way too much to understand like how are people leaning? And I think these surveys are crazy overstated in terms of influence. But if I can study, you know, why is a company spending on R and D or why, why, have, why are they laying off people or why they grown that, why their inventory levels up? Like what is driven their inventory levels up? And then if you look at it across a series of companies and all of a sudden you can say, okay, now I understand why employment and the economy is starting to slow or what have you. But that's the only thing I think works. Like I think trying to do it from the top down, I just don't think it's durable because you don't understand the underlying catalysts or instigants to drive the economy or a certain sector of the economy. So I really believe you got to get, you know, intent. part of what AI is so exciting is the ability to do this at scale. And it actually run models and run AI to say, you know, home builders, what's happening in home builders around, um, you know, what, you know, how much have they had to provide in their own financing to drive their business? And if you do it over scale and look at different, it's a, it's a fragmented industry. Well, if all of a sudden I can look at the industry through AI, boy, that's, you know, that's pretty darn exciting. So anyway, I, I really believe in that, that you got to start from the bottom and work your, and work your way up and, and you know, assimilating as much data into your process is uh, is a key to that. So you you have access to more data than almost anybody, and and in a way that puts you in a more extreme version of of the uh, the challenge that most of us face, which is somehow distinguishing signal from noise, somehow figuring out what actually is relevant. And you you do these kind of legendary monthly calls, right? I think over a thousand people sometimes call in for these yeah. calls to hear you opine about the markets and the direction of the economy and the like. And I, I wanted to get a sense of what your process is, where you're taking this immense amount of information, this immense amount of data. A lot of other people, I, mm -hmm. I guess, have access to some of it. Um, but you're kind of somehow crunching and distilling and synthesizing it so that you can take a view, so that you can kind of point the ship in the right direction and then, and then kind of trade within that framework. What the hell are you doing? What's the process and what can we learn from that about how to distinguish um, real news yeah. from just noise? So, I mean, I think that's one of the keys to investment. Part of the great investment I've seen is just the ability to actually isolate. That's an important piece of news. So the only way, and, it, and maybe it's embarrassing, it's, it's somewhat archaic. Like I look at, you know, I, you know, I brainstorm with, our, with my team and, and we say, you know, I, I throw out some ideas. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And now the team starts to pull a bunch of the data and put it on graphs and look at tables and what have you. And then I literally spend like on a weekend, this is crazy, but I, I spend on Saturday, you know, Saturday when I do these monthly calls, I mean, a good 10 hours and then Sunday, probably probably about the same. And then I try and literally put a, you know, look at all the data and say, and then, you know, you get these aha moments and maybe it's just like I say, archaic that, um, that it takes a while to think of like, why is dollar yen doing what it's doing? Why are two-year swaps doing what they're doing? You know, what's happening to the cross-currency basis? And like all of a sudden, and then you see like some things tend to like come together like, I got it and I, and I got it. And I think the only reason why I think so many people dial into these monthlies is, you know, we try and take all this data and put it together in a somewhat cohesive pattern of, well, this happening and that's happening and that's happening. The conclusions should be X, Y, and Z, which are not always right. But um, but we, but the idea of you take so much intense data to try and um, to try and come up with your set of conclusions, and I just haven't figured out another way to do it. And um, you know, like I say, AI is helping us get more of the information and the data. And by the way, I work with counterparties who help me with a ton of it, who have you know their own internal systems and or see flows or research, and then they help me and they send over a bunch of information based on you know I'm trying to go down a certain stream of investigation. And then, you know, they'll like all put it together. And by the way, like 90 something percent of what you really, it's like noise is garbage. And like, okay, you know, this is happening because somebody was long or somebody was short and it's driven the currency to a certain level. I need to try and like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. But all the, you know, these pieces seem to have a cohesive stream to it that, you know, and so we, you know, we, I tend to move my position around more around those. I, thankfully, they're not weekly or I'd be divorced. But the, uh, the uh, you know, thankfully, my wife lets me spend one weekend a month socially isolated and they um and, and then the uh you know try and put all these things together but it, i found it it's like the critical node to our uh you know to how we position and we manage it but you know, i think you know thankfully i think a lot of you know a lot of people have found them interesting 
So if you were actually forced to focus on just a, a handful of pieces of data, like if, 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 if you were told, look, you can only have two or three pieces of data, um, and you just abandon everything else, just not available to you. When you're trying to figure out the future direction of inflation and, and interest rates and bond yields and the like, if you really had to distill it down to the absolute essence of what's most important to you, what, what do you pay attention to? What would be most valuable to you? Wow, that's a good question. The, um, so, hmm, how do, I, how do I think through this? The, um, you know, I, say I would throw out a lot of survey data because I think it's noise. And oftentimes, I shouldn't say it's all noise. Like oftentimes how people are positioned is helpful. And, you know, it gives, tends to gives you, gives you some directional help at times around inflection points. But I find that most surveys predict nine out of three right events. And um, so if you said to me, I can only use two or three pieces of information or data, you know, I would always err on the side of looking at corporate activity and, you know, looking, reading too many documents around you know what's happening with uh, with companies, and then and then you know the cons you know consumer data. I mean, seventy percent of the U.S. economy is consumption oriented or service oriented, and today, to me, you know, I'm always amazed. Like people look at the at the at the you know the same analogs for how the economy operated in the '70s and '80s, and the economy is much more sophisticated, much more service oriented, much more mature, technology oriented, and so I really like digging in in terms of consumer service, what's driving the service sector. And that, you know, that to me gives me a better, like, I still can't believe that people spend so much time on some of the manufacturing activity, you know, which is, you know, not the, not what drives the economy today, you know, particularly in an aging demography, it's healthcare and education and service and technology. So I don't know, those are the things I, I tend to, I tend to focus more on, but it is definitely the hard data, you know, really good hard data. And, and oftentimes the big economic releases are an aggregated mess. Because they tell you, oh, it's up point two. Well, up up point two means nothing because you have one sector that's killing another sector that's getting crushed. Like, what is it telling you? Like, I don't even like it's it's that meaningful. The only thing is markets respond to it. So, like I've learned, like we can, you know, you have to be respectful of your data. Markets move on sentiment. And if you know, you could know like what's happening on inflation, and we've studied the million prices and look at but like the markets focus on the CPI report. If it's up 0.4, up 0.3, or 0.2, it's like that's what the markets move on. So you got to have the good data, but then be really you know thoughtful about if the markets are going to react to you know some pieces of news that are you know less robust. You also have to consider that in your investment in investment process. Yeah, I, I remember hearing you say at one point markets are, are all about turns in the data. And it was one of those things that sort of so obvious and yet that I hadn't really thought about that, that, um, because I guess so many of the investors that I focus on, on the whole, are these much more long-term investors. And in a way it goes back to the famous Ben Graham statement where he said in the, in the, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. And so most of the investors I look at, like, like the sort of Munger Buffett types that they're, they're working on the basis that they want the market to be um their servant and so they're taking these very long they're they're taking advantage of the short-term volatility to place these kind of long-term trades you in a way is often doing something very different right where you're you're playing the part of graham's statement about the market being a voting machine so i'd say a couple of things first of all i don't really like bull markets you know i might i get grumpy in bull markets because I think the opportunity set, like, it, you know, that to me levels the playing field. Like everybody jumps on the trend, like we're all buying together. And you see this in some of the new issue markets, whether it's the IPO market, the equity market, or the new issue market in credit. Like everybody, you know, everybody likes to hold hands, get a warm feeling around. We're all buying together. It all feels good. And, and the consensus move under it. I find that incredibly unfulfilling. And I'm perfectly, I don't think there's a lot of money in it because everybody is doing the same thing at the same time and probably getting long at the wrong time. I actually find fragmented, dislocated markets, and often those which are bear markets, are much more interesting and where there's much more return to be generated because, you know, you are, you know, prices, people, I always say this, markets go down five times faster than they go up. And it's really the case that, you know, and markets iterate higher, people take profits. When they go down, people don't like to lose money. And that's where there's real opportunity. And that's where I think it becomes much more interesting, where you can use your research, use your analytics, and try and figure out, 
gosh, something is over, is something is overdone. And that to me is a whole lot more interesting than just playing along. And by the way, sometimes you got to do this. Sometimes you got to, consensus can be right for a period of time. You just got to ride alongside of it. But I don't find that nearly as fulfilling as, uh, you know, markets that are dislocated, you know, disjointed, where you can do your work and really try and, uh, you know, isolate, gosh, there's some real value here. And I think some of the, you know, some of the people that I, that I found that, that are, like, you know, David Tepper at, at uh, you know, Apple, I was like, he's unbelievable. It's like when markets are broken, like he goes to work. And I think that's, you know, I think that's a very cool way to, uh, you know, that's where I think the real money is. When, when you look at friends of yours, like David Tepper or Ray Dalio or Paul Tudor Jones, or, um, uh, I guess Stanley Druckenmiller, these, these legendary investors often, often kind of speculators in a way, traders, um, what do they have in common? I mean, what's the, and, and does it in some way remind you of what you see? I, I know you're a huge sports watcher. Uh, does it remind you of what you see in the great athletes in a way? So, I mean, taking, you know, they all take a lot of risk and they, uh, you know, they all, you know, they all are, are, um, they all like having, you know, maybe to use that sports metaphor, they all like having the ball in their hand at the end of the game. And they're, you know, they're pretty, you know, they like being the decision maker. They like being the one who is at the inflection point, like to be the person, you know, willing to take that risk. And I, and I think all of those people had to try, they're very different in terms of how they create alpha or how they create returns, a very different philosophies. And, but they were all, I think they were all pretty extraordinary in that they like taking risks, they like being, making the decision and they, and in very different ways, all of those are, are incredible students of the market and what they're trying to, what they're trying to do. And, um, you know, some are really, really good at technical, some are really good at big picture where we are versus history. Some are really good at distress and understanding distress, but they're incredible students of, uh, of the markets and, and they're willing to, they're willing to take risk. I mean, they're willing to say, okay, I'm willing, you know, we talk about the separate the news from the noise. Once they understand the news and what's a critical inflection point or the regime, and I spent a lot of time trying to think about regime and they're really, really good in different ways of saying, okay, this is a regime evolution time to time to go. And, um, you know, I think they're all pretty consistent around doing that. That seems also very central to your process. This, this idea of regime identification of, of identifying the type of environment we're in and then positioning yourself in a way that's, that's sympathetic to that kind of regime and then trading within that framework, given that that's something that's so central to your approach. When, when you look at where we are today, say with a six month view or a one year view, like where are we? What's your bet in terms of interest rates, inflation, bond yields and the like? Like is, you know, if you, if you had to distill it down to give you a picture of basically where we are in, in this sort of the, the pendulum swing of markets, where are we now? So, you know, how I actually don't think like, uh, you know, I know in the media and in, in the TV yesterday or other, you know, they talk about we soft landing, hard landing. And I actually don't think like a modern economy that is driven by services tends not to go through those epic cycles. It tends to be much more stable. And I think we're in a period of we went through massive amounts of fiscal and monetary stimulus. And so what happens is the economy tends to follow the demographic curve with incredible consistency over the intermediate term. But then once you use policy aggressively, you come off the curve, but then you got to get back on the curve. And over time, you're going to get back on the curve. And I think we're in the process of getting back on the curve. And we got to, you know, and part of what I talked about, there's too much debt on the U.S. economy. So it was utilized to, to get off the curve because the pandemic was so was so brutal for the, uh, for the, the system. So, but now we got to get back on the curve, including repaying some of the debt, including funding all this debt. And I think what's happening is we're getting back on the curve. And I and and by the way, I don't I don't think it's you still have a consumer that's got savings. You still have uh, a wealth effect that's reasonable on the backside of this epic monetary and fiscal stimulus. So you, you and, and you have corporate capex that's spending on technology and innovation because largely because you have to bring your costs down now because you can't can't keep decreasing price anymore. You know, I think price elasticity is coming back in. Like we've, we've raised the price. We raised, okay, we can't raise the price again because the economy is moderating. 
cut costs. What does that mean? I think inflation is moderating. Growth is going is coming down, but I think to a reasonable place that and 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 by the way, the level of where the economy is after you grow nominal GDP at such high levels, you're still in a pretty darn good economic condition that allows companies to throw off cash flow, et cetera. So anyway, I I don't I think we're in this period of moderation from being way above the curve. I don't think it augurs for you know, real depression, recession or deep recession, you know, different in parts of Europe where you got to be, you know, a bit careful, China got to be a bit careful. But I think the U.S. economy is much more of a, by the way, I think both of those will, will be fine as well. But I think we are moderating. And I think the investment paradigm from here is create a lot of income because now we have this incredible blessing of this, uh, you know, yields really high and you can create income at um, at very attractive levels because of that. And then try and marry that to an to a stock market or, you know, whether that's venture capital or others that, you know, are going to be, you know, just okay for a period of time. And so get a lot of income and then try and manage your manage your return in beta or equity like investments for, you know, what is less spectacular return from here. If you're a regular investor and you you you're not like hugely excited by bonds, but you're aware that after they got crushed in 2022, there's the environment is sort of changing a bit and there's a little more opportunity there. I mean, you're an expert on asset allocation with, within BlackRock. How, how should we be thinking about taking advantage of the opportunities if, say, we have a diversified portfolio and, and we want to reduce risk and, and get some generous yield? Say we want to make 6 or 7% off bonds without crazy risk. What do you, what's the simple way to do it without needing to be a bond expert? I mean, I think today, I mean, A, there, there's ETFs, there's mutual funds that are, you know, studying people's style or what have you that can get you six and a half, seven. And, you know, it's, you know, if rates come down, maybe the, maybe that is six, five and a half, six. But I think we have some time. I think the central banks, you will still keep rates. They want to make sure they put a stake in, in, in inflation. The, and, uh, but boy, I, you know, by the way, treasuries work, you know, things like high quality assets, like agency mortgages, investment grade credit, and there's some ETFs, there's some funds that get you that. You don't, I mean, this is one of these unique points in time where, gosh, you can buy high quality assets and cl clip a lot of yield. And so it doesn't mean, you know, there are points in time you got to use like emerging markets. Do you want to buy Brazil versus Argentina? That gets really complex. Do you want to buy, you know, you know, tranche complex commercial mortgage security hard? Hard to do. There's some funds that, that I think do it well. Hopefully, we have we have some of those that do that do well at it. And the uh, but otherwise today we're in an environment like gosh, treasuries, the attractive um, mortgages, investment grade. So buying high quality yielding assets through funds, ETFs, or outright, like this is a pretty good time to get income. Is it you know even an investor that's not deep into it every day. And you said before that um, actually, un unlike in the stock market, it's actually much easier to beat the indexes when it yep. comes to bonds. What, why is that? So there are a couple of things. First of all, the, you know, it's interesting. So you think about, you would never buy a company that puts on more and more leverage. And, but do you think about the index is for fixed income? The more debt you put on, the bigger you are in the index. And, you know, it's di you know, different than the equity market, you know, almost, it's almost, almost counterintuitive in the, in the equity market, the company's doing well and the market cap is high. There are a lot of things they could do. In bonds, the more debt you put on, the more you're in the index. Why would you ever want to fight by that? And so the idea of being first, get the, you know, who is over levered. And by the way, where are you not getting paid for it? There are parts of the index and there's 68,000 securities in fixed income. It's different than the S&P 500. There's 68,000. So there are so many assets that trade too rich because central banks, reserve managers have to own them. And like, get rid of them. They don't give you any yield. They don't do anything for you. So kick those out. And I think those, you know, can you create, you know, 25 base points or 50 base points of alpha and kick out all the stuff that's not worth it. And then, you know, use, you know, your research, your analytics, et cetera, that then think through where are you optimizing return versus your, versus your, your risk allocation. And then, you know, we do a lot of bespoke financing that is, you know, it's hard, you know, a AAA CLO hard, you know, I can never on my personal account do that. But gosh, if I can understand the collateral, you know, the structure of the manager, et cetera, like, boy, they trade pretty cheap relative to other AAA assets. And so, you know, your ability to tap into a bunch of those is, you know, by the way, not just, not just ourselves for sure, 
but I think it's something like 85% of fixed income managers outperform over, over, over time the indices. And, and I think it's because of the structure of the index and, and so many securities you can tap into that, that allow you to do it. And by the way, cat, I've learned over my career, income wins. And, uh, you know, if you can manage your income and I like, it's the secret sauce or, uh, for fixed income, if you can run a higher level of income and just manage your downside, carry wins, it compounds beautifully. And, you know, you see this in like, why is the high yield market over time do pretty darn well, even relative to equities, coupon income wins. And so, you know, it's a you know, part of the, you know, I think the secret sauce in fixed income is get it, you know, get as much income as you can in and then try to manage the downside of that. We talked a bit about one of your key competitive advantages, which is just the sheer amount of data that you have and your ability to analyze it and, and get a picture of, of where you stand. Um, it strikes me just studying your, your life and your career that the other huge advantage that you have is a more personal and temperamental one, which is the sheer fanaticism of your, of your drive and your work ethic. And I, I wonder if you could start by talking a bit about your typical day when it starts, what you do, because it's unusual. And uh, you know, I remember La Larry Fink had a great quote, the CEO of BlackRock, who said his particular strength is his headfirst approach to everything he does. He does everything with an incredible passion. And he said, yeah. I, I tend to like passionate people. And he said more than 50% of what attracted me to Rick and having him come to BlackRock was his personal being and his character. So passion and intensity is central to, to the Rick Reader kind of modus operandi. So tell us about your typical day. So yeah, no, I'm a, so first of all, I have, I have signs all over my house. So I have two, two, two common philosophies. One is work hard, play hard, give back, reboot. Like I run a really simple, and the other one is life is not a dress rehearsal. Like, I, like I'm, I'm in it. You know, I, I, I have a very simple life. You know, I have my friends, my family. And the, um, yeah, you no, know, I have my job and then, uh, and then, you know, I like, I like sports and, and, uh, but I have a really simple, you know, there are three sports teams that I'm super passionate about and the, um, but I, you know, it's a really simple life. I get up early. I get up crazy early. I get up three forty five in the morning and, you know, I look at markets. I oftentimes trade early in the morning and I work out and then, uh, you know, and I go and I'm pretty intense all day. And I really believe in this idea of work hard, play hard, get back, reboot. And then like, you got one shot at it. And like, I want, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, life affords you the, uh, affords you this opportunity to take advantage and do a bunch of different things to, you know, hopefully contribute. And, um, so I'm pretty intense about it. You know, I go, well, like my meeting day, and I know there's a bad, there's a, you know, our CEO Larry says this all the time that, you know, you gotta, you gotta take time off in space in your day to think I schedule meetings like 15 minutes and strategy sessions and research sessions. Like I'm, I, every 15 minute quadrant is taken up in the, you know, it's probably the wrong, but I, anyway, I really believe there's so much we could do that, um, you know, that I like, that I like to do it. And I, you know, I wouldn't say like, there's a lot of things that I don't, you know, I've just determined maybe I was just getting older. Like I, there's just certain things that I'm not going to do in life, but I, but you know, I believe in, you know, I like doing what I like to do and I, and I believe in, uh, you know, putting a lot of intensity to it. So part of it, Part of the strategy, and I, I'd, I'd like to break this down more because I think it's both very, very, very idiosyncratic, but also it points us towards um, the sort of an understanding of the street at the extreme end of high performance. So if we break this down a little bit, part of it is that you absolutely love what you're doing. So you, so, so it's not that burdensome for you to spend twenty hours at the weekend once every four weeks studying the market, right? I mean, that's oh, and and you read a lot other weekends as well, just maybe not 20 hours. Is, is that fair to say that just yeah, actually loving it is kind of at the heart of this? Totally. My wife always says to me, like on vacation, I'm reading work stuff and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, I, you know, I, like if I read, if I read uh, Apple's earnings report and I can understand like why are the peripherals doing, you know, doing what they're doing, why, it, why is, you know, why they sold so many I, iPhones, are they selling into India versus China? Like to me, that's the coolest thing. I mean, I find it incredibly intriguing and I don't know why I, I enjoy it. I've, I, the, uh, you know, it's just like, you can't keep up with the amount of stuff that, um, you know, that's out there. And so, yeah, no, I, I, it's like, a, it's literally, you know, I imagine it's like, if you're a treasure hunter, you know, reading a 10 K for, I think for most people wouldn't be that exciting, but like, if you read through it, then like all of a sudden you realize like, wow, now I need to realize their cash flow is driven because they've been cutting costs as opposed to reinvesting in their business. Oh, 
I, you know, I think I found something that, you know, I thought I, th I found that like a challenge and, um, and I find it super fun. So, it, you know, but if you didn't have that, if it wasn't interesting to you, yeah, I know that it would be, it would be work. And, um, you know, I don't, you know, I find it, I find it, like I said, the business fascinating. I and mean, there are not many businesses like this that are so dynamic and so, you know, ever changing that, um, that become intriguing It's part of, you know, it's very akin to like you were saying with sports, like what's so cool about sports is like, you're just watching a constant dynamism taking place and the, and the score changing and like what happens and how do you react and how do you react on the fly? You know, I think the markets are, are quite, quite similar to that. And the markets, economies, businesses are quite similar to that. I remember Peter Lynch saying to Bill Miller early in Bill's career that, um, Bill, Bill said, can you ever slow down? And he said, not really. He said, there are really two gears, either full speed ahead or stop. And, and Bill said to me, yeah, that's actually about right. Do you, do you think that's true that to play a game at this kind of level, the, the sort of game that you're playing, you actually can't slow down because you would lose your sort of total mark? Because in a sense, you're having to carry all of this market information, economic information in your head at once. No, my wife will tell you, I've said all the time, there's only, there are only two, uh, two calibrations on the tile. It's 10 or zero. And, you know, when I, when, you know, I collapse at night, it, you know, I, we run the engine really hard and the, um, but I really think that, you know, it's so hard and I've watched, uh, you know, a number of, it's so hard. I mean, they, the, the intensity they have to bring to it. And, um, you know, I think you're either all in or you're not. And, um, I think it's so hard to do it in a peripheral way. And by the way, not to say that some people aren't hugely successful in what they're trying to achieve and looking at slices of the market or slices of, of anyway, there are, and there are obviously very varying levels of, of success around that, you know, how you want to achieve what you're trying to achieve. But yeah, and no, I think there's an intensity to, um, I, I mean, you know, same thing with playing golf and et cetera. I, I feel like you know, whatever, whether it's right or wrong, I feel like it's either a 10 or a zero. And, um, and I don't, I don't, you know, like doing this a six. And you get to the end of the day and it goes down to a zero and you're watching sports. I know, know you like the Baltimore Orioles and you just yeah. people like that. You, you kind of, you, you, when do you fall asleep? When do you like, what's the evening? Like when it's, when it's some it's like, downtime. I said, as soon as I sit down, the, uh, yeah, no, I, I, it literally, I mean, I, you know, it's all of a sudden, you know, I sit and I, I turn, depending on the game, you, know, you turn it on or you turn on whatever show you're watching or reading or what have you, but it's pretty, as soon as I, uh, you know, as soon as you sit on the couch, it pretty much, it's almost instantaneous that the, <laughs> so I, by the way, when I do a lot of work and a lot of research at night and I try and, uh, try and not sit down or I try and do it in a, in a way that I can't fall asleep, but yeah, no, at the end of the day. It, um, and by the way, you know, I, I don't, I don't, it's, you know, I, I tend to recharge really quickly and, um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I study, I have this whoop band that I think is incredible because it, it, you know, shows you your, your strain. It shows you how you're sleeping. You know, I have, I get in a really deep and REM sleep, whether that's because you run the engine so hard early, you know, during the day, but I tend to sleep intensely. And I, it, by the way, it's happened with, <laughs> You know, we've had like something happens in the house or like there's a loud and like, I don't even hear it because I'm, I am so, uh, deep in sleep, but I tend to, I get like really deep REM and, uh, deep sleep. And, uh, so, you know, you tend to recharge pretty, pretty quickly. And are you, you're just sleeping about four hours or what? Yes, sir. So I, so I take four and a half, uh, a night and I'd like to say, because I think you get into, you know, get into really, really deep sleep quickly. And I tend to be like, I don't wake up tired. I got, you know, and, you know, there was an interesting thing that we did. We tested our, our stress and I'll never forget this. They said to me, um, they, uh, they tested, you know, using it was a different form of the whoop band, but they said, um, you know, anything, your stress level peaks. And, uh, and I said, I don't know. And they said 1130 at night. I said, no, I get it. And they, and they said, when do you think it comes down? I said, they said at about 345 in the morning. And they said, why do you think that is? I said, I don't know what that is. Because I tend, you know, when I'm in, you know, I'm in control and I can see the markets, then it's a very different paradigm than when I go to sleep, I have to put my phone down. And, you know, by the way, they tested this during the time that China was really volatile and it was driving the markets. But I know, like, I don't like that feeling of not seeing what's happening and the markets moving around when I'm quote unquote, not in, not in control of our, of our, you know, trajectory around our, our positioning. And so it, uh, I don't know, I, human mind is pretty crazy that way that, uh, you know, you like to, as long as you're in control, you can see the markets, you know, even on vacation, like I check the markets 
nonstop. And I feel better. I mean, I feel more relaxed if I if I can do that. Like I don't, I I really don't like the feeling of like people say, put your phone away. Like I I feel much more relaxed if I can at least peer at it periodically to understand, you know, that things are okay. And um, so So I wonder if part of it is actually just knowing what type of weirdo we are. Like <laughs> you you have to be a really great operator of the machine called Rick Reader, right? So you you operate on a different amount of sleep than most people. And it, it, I mean, it's just like, it seems like there's something kind of anomalous about the way you operate. Yeah, no, I, yeah. And I, I, I say, you know, up a pretty intense level, but you know, it's interesting. Like we, you know, we're talking about earlier, like if you're not motivated to do what you're doing, like, you know, I just wouldn't. And then now, now I, I feel like I'm, you're, you're so energized by what you're doing, not just at work, but whether it's family stuff or philanthropic stuff or, you know, sports stuff that I follow, I'm so energized by what I'm, by what I'm doing. I feel like, you know, I just want to get up and do it and, uh, or participate in it. So. Well, I had this really interesting image of you doing nighttime trading, right? Where you would get up at three forty-five, you kind of check Twitter and the like and, and check the markets. And then my sense is that you're doing a lot of trading between 4 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. Yes. And you had this lovely phrase where you talked about the unchaperoned European <laughs> trading hours. Can yes. you talk about what you're doing during those hours? Because it seems in some way to embody a lot of what you're about, your love of the markets, the fact that you're getting some kind of edge because you understand the yeah. meaning of the data that other people don't necessarily understand that suddenly where suddenly an event is happening and you're not competing with that many people who understand what it means. Talk about those early hours. So it's a hundred percent right. I mean, I, you know, part of it, you're saying this, that you know, those markets are unchaperoned at those time at that time, you know, most of the time the markets in a 24 hour cycle that, you know, Asia is open while the U S is open or Europe's open while Asia is open, et cetera. And there are times where you just have a, a small set of traders you know, generally that are operating and, and that, and, you know, I would say it, they tend to overreact to things and it tends to be more of a, I do describe it, more of a trading and they tend to overreact to, to nuanced pieces of data that are just not that inter that are not that meaningful. And so what happens is in those markets that tend to be pretty thin that, you know, there'll be a piece of news and the markets will like grossly overreact to it either way. And I find like being an almost I would say 90% of the times that I trade in those hours, if the market's up, I sell it and vice versa. And because it almost always, not always, but it almost always overreacts because it's a thin market and it reacts to superficial data. So anyway, so I like, in, in a similarly, you know, I always found like your differentiated advantage or in markets, you know, picking, you know, the big liquid, you know, the do, you know, dollar euro is hard because it's big, it's liquid, it's got flows from non-economic players, corporates, sovereign central banks. But, you know, the markets, if, you know, we're looking at a CLO that we may be the only one or two or three people, and we could look at the structure and analyze it, what have you, the odds almost definitionally are much better. And so I tend to like those markets that are less efficient, that are, um, you know, there are less people parsing out or eliminating the, the, uh, the alpha that's there. It seems like the, there's such a, there's such a, simple but important lesson there about just playing playing games against weak players where you have an edge so i don't i mean i by the way i you know one thing i've always said i always feel this like the competitors and people that are in there are, are not smarter than me or as smart as me by a by a, but so i don't know the necessarily weaker players i think there is i would say fewer players that are in that are that are you know in investigating a specific situation, you know, which is a real estate transaction we're involved with, you know, they're probably, we're not probably, probably not competing against a thousand people that are doing it. And, you know, if we can look at the mezzanine part of the structure or the equity, you know, we're probably one of few players that are going to do it. And so your economics tend to be, tend to be better. So it's definitely not the weaker players, but, um, you know, I just think if you have, you know, the ability to, to tilt the odds a bit more in your favor, um, you know, versus where, you know, most people in, in the markets like to be in the hot, you know, really popular big areas. And I, I just think there are too many people in it that squeezes the alpha out of it. Talk to me about how you deal with just the sheer pressure of what you're doing, because one of the things that's very distinctive about your position is just the incredible range 
and size of responsibilities, right? We mentioned that you're overseeing about $2.6 trillion. I think you have about 350 people in the fixed income team. You're running various funds like the Strategic Income Opportunities Fund, which I think on its own is about $36 billion in, in assets. Maybe my numbers are outdated. And you've right. got the, the firm-wide BlackRock Investment Council that you're the chairman of. There, so you have this enormous array of both management responsibilities and investment responsibilities. Do you ever get overwhelmed by it all? Are you like are there ways that you're dealing with the pressure that are instructive for the rest of us? Because I think I think all of us are struggling on a, a no doubt smaller scale in most of our ways, but all of us are struggling. I think with a sense of being kind of overwhelmed, not knowing quite how to juggle things in our lives. So it's hard. I mean, I you know I'd be lying if I said I figured it out or even have any any sense of mastery over it. I think there is. Listen, I think one of the things I always say is you try and put things into into a box and try and think about, you know, strategically, you know, what it what it means. And then, you know, you got, you know, definitionally all, you know, I get bad news all day, like all day. And, you know, whenever you know they do this argument about tennis players, you get 54% of the of the points when 54%, you know, like you're getting 46% of the time, you're getting bad news. And so, you know, I just think I, you know, I know there are many good or I've but, you know, you try and like put it in a box and you recognize that statistically you're going to get bad news a lot and that, but don't let it overwhelm you or don't let the stress overwhelm you. And then, you know, statistically, by the way, and I, I will say like, there are days like you get three things in a row that go wrong in a significant way and like, wow, that, and, and like all of it, but you think about over 365 days, statistically, that's always going to happen. And what I've learned is like, just you got to you got to respect the fact that that is going to happen and to have the, high, the highs not be too high and the lows not not be too low but i'd be lying if i didn't say like when things are going awry or you have those three things in a row that went wrong or three days in a row that you lost money you know i, I can't say i'm not in a bad mood like it uh, you know i think what part of what drives you is like how to correct when things aren't aren't going wrong but listen i'm mean, a you know i i enjoy I and mean, i know when i go to see the doctor and and uh you know, we were talking about it. You know, I like I like stress. I like pressure. And um, you know, I think I'd I think I'd uh, I really believe this. So it keeps people going. And I think once you like eliminate all that, you know, the intent, the stress, you know, you tend to decline. I think. And um, but anyway, I like different people and different levels of that. But I um anyway, I like it. I like I like doing a lot a lot of things at once. And uh, it sort, of, you, sort of keeps you going. Are you using the sense of pressure in the sense of stress in your body as a kind of um, as a signal in terms of your trading in the way that, say, Soros would talk about watching his back pain as, a, as an indicator that something was wrong in his portfolio? Or I remember Jeff Vinnick, who ran the Magellan Fund in his early 30s, telling me that sometimes he would buy a stock that was so out of favor that he would literally feel nauseous. And that was, he, he learned that that was a really good sign. Like, how are you actually using your stress so that it helps you as a trader? So, so come on. So, by the way, you know, it's always nice to be even considered of people like that because I have unbelievable respect for them. But, you know, I, so I think a couple of things. One, I've learned to walk around and, uh, you know, I feel like, like you can just stare at the markets and stare at every blip. And like, I've learned like, just walk around, you know, get away and take a walk around the block. And, you know, you got to get away from you know, particularly when things aren't going the way you expect them to go or want them to go. I've learned to like, you know, just get away. And, uh, and, you know, I've also learned there's a, there's a really wild thing. Like I find that, that, um, Mondays and Fridays are less effective as an investor than, than the middle of the week. And I don't know whether that is, you're just winding down markets are less liquid on Fridays or Monday. There's a little bit of, you're just not, the intensity isn't there yet coming up a weekend, but I, it's interesting that I find, I try not to, you know, particularly on a on a on a Friday, I try and maybe tone it down a little bit around you know all the decisions you're making and all the th all the things you're doing. And I, you know, whether that is anecdotal or uh, or there's a quantitative basis behind that, but I definitely find that that is that is the case. You need to take a bit of you know a bit of a break. And I think you know I think part of why um, whether it's a vacation calendar or otherwise that um, you know, to, to try and uh, try and step back from some of these things at uh, at times. I don't know there's a physical dynamic around it, other than I know I need to like when things aren't going right, you know, take a walk around and just relax. You know, try and think about the big picture as opposed to the uh, you know the specifics.
And are there things that you're doing to manage your energy level? Because I know you're wearing the Whoop strap, you're you're wearing your Apple Watch, you, you love data in every area, whether it's with your philanthropy or <laughs> markets or with your health. Like, what are you doing to make sure that you don't crash during the day? Like, are you are you off sugar? Are you drinking tons of caffeine? Are you do you meditate? Do you take naps? Do you have a personal trainer? Like, are there is there anything wow. distinctive about like how you're actually managing your health and your energy? So I tried meditating. So Ray Dalio, I think, is a genius. And he, you know, he taught me about meditating. I can't do it. I tried. I can't do it. I don't know. I just got, I have to pick my phone up within 30 seconds. I can't really do it. I tried. I understand. By the way, I got into it when I did it. I try. I totally understand the efficacy of it. I totally understand. But I don't, you know, what I, I, um, you know, I would say, I, I've, so I'll say one thing that is interesting. I don't really, you know, you go out to dinners with clients and you do things and like, I don't like to drink much because I, I it's incredible. You, if I follow it on the whoop, like you realize, like if you have a couple of drinks, you don't realize it, but how it changes your sleep patterns, how it changes your, uh, the deep, you know, the intensity of your sleep, how you end up dreaming versus getting. So anyway, I try, I try not to, you know, just eat, eat a bit better. And, uh, I try not to drink, you know, particularly during the week of, uh, you know, even, you know, I'll never have more than one drink during the, during the week, even the weekends, I don't drink much. And I, so I find like, I try and manage that. And then, um, and then, you know, then otherwise just, you know, work out, I have a, you know, a trainer, I work out almost seven days a week or I'm doing, and, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, start trying to stay in shape and, and, uh, but I think all those things, all those things contributed and manage, you know, manage the, uh, the energy level. But, uh, but I don't know. I, I also feel like, like, I don't know. I feel like I have a lot of, I feel like at my age now, I have as much energy as I had 40 years ago. And, um, you know, like I said, I think a lot of it because I really love, you know, the, a lot of the things that are, that are, you know, I'm happy about in my life. And you're not without, not without threats alongside of it. Yeah. But you're working out at like 4.30 in the morning, right? Yes, sir. 4.40. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no, we go, you know, go early and then, um, you know, but then it's great and I can get to my desk and, uh, and, and start the day. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it is, it is early. It's usually not a line at the gym for any of the When you say or... we go early, are you going with a trainer to. Yeah, no, I work, I generally half the week I work out, you know, roughly three days a week. I, I, I work out with a trainer, but otherwise I'll play golf or work out on my own, but, but yeah. So there are a few patterns here that I think are really interesting. One, one of which is consistent exercise, doing something you're passionate about simplifying your life so that it's i mean i my sense is it revolves around family friends work sports and exercise right i i read somewhere you're, you're not a great fan of going to museums or movies and, and the like like you've you've simplified and and yeah. then philanthropy will which we'll get to in a minute if you don't mind me asking you a few more questions before you catch your flight that's okay oh good yeah i know good no, I, sorry, we even asked specific questions. I mean, is that it? right? That it's it, a lot of it is down to simplicity, like the ability to actually simplify your life makes it possible to streamline it into a few buckets of things that are really the, the core focus of what you do. That that makes it manageable in a way, this complexity of your life. I mean, I've totally, re I mean, I've realized there's just certain things I'm not going to be any good at. And like you say, you know, I, I tend not, not to watch a lot of, watch a lot of movies. And, um, you know, I, I find that, um, you know, I find that if I can, if I can accomplish more things and do, do more things around what I, you know, not, not to say that it is, I'm growing necessarily by sitting and watching the dolphins game, but, but anyway, I, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. And so, yeah, no, I, I just have realized like, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, and I'm pretty maniacal about those, are, those are the things that take my time. And how, how have you managed to sustain a successful family life for all these years? Cause I, my sense is you. You got married about 36 years ago. I remember Charlie Munger, when he read my book, was like, uh, yeah, one thing that struck me was just how many of us ended up getting divorced. And he said it kind of totally made sense because he said the game is so all-consuming all that we sort of neglected our partners. And I'm wondering, like, you you have two adult daughters who my sense is you're, you're close to. Like, how, how do you manage to operate at a very high level without totally sacrificing family and friends? If you know, you, I think it comes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I'm mean, in my family. We are like crazy close. And you know, so I think, I think a lot of it is, you know, this idea of simplifying, like I, you know, when I'm, you know, with my family and friends, not to say I'm not looking at my phone, but the, uh, but you know, it's, it's a really good quality time. We love, I mean, we go to dinners, vacation, I mean, then, you know, we just like being with each other. I mean, literally you could sit at a table. Maybe we don't even talk that much at the, 
you know, you know, whatever, but, but just being together, I think it's a really big thing. And I also think it's having complimentary, you know, so I, I think, I think particularly my wife, I mean, we have very complimentary, you know, she's not into the markets at all. And, um, you know, and I think, I think having, um, you know, complimentary, um, desires in terms of, you know, what she likes to do when I like to do. And, and, um, you know, she's very patient around, uh, you know, around, around the business life, but, you know, it's when we, um, you know, we do, we do things together that, that are, um, you know, I think I've made it, made it really good. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we just like being with each other, even if I'm, you know, even if I'm working, you know, I like, you know, being in the same room and, uh, so. And you have these two adult daughters, Danielle and Melanie, who both went to Emory's business school, like you and, and your wife, Deborah. And you mentioned before the two of your credos that you have around the house of one life is not a dress rehearsal and two work hard, play hard, give back, reboot. Is there other advice that you've tried to share with your daughters that would be helpful to the rest of us, whether, whether in business or, or, or life? I mean, I, I know one of your daughters works at Walmart, I think. What, what, do, what do you try to share with them that, um, that could benefit the rest of us? So, I, so well, that's a good question. I mean, I think there are a few things. One, you know, I really believe in, you know, treating people the right way. And, and uh, you know, my kids are unbelievable about, you know, treat people the right way. You know, I know I think I sort of alluded to this earlier. Like I watch how people treat service level people or people that are, you know, there's some people who feel like, you know, you're here to serve me and other people are like, wow, they're, those are really high quality people that, you know, you treat res with respect. And, and, you know, I think my kids are unbelievable about, you know, being respectful and, 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 and polite and treating people the right, the, the right way, I think is, is to me, number one, number one thing, you know, I think the, you know, this idea around, I also believe in this thesis that people bring stuff to you all the time. And I always say, you got to go and get it as opposed to letting people, like I find like the opportunities that have been, you know, we've had, whether it's investments or otherwise, oftentimes people bringing stuff to you is not what you want to invest in or do or what have you. It's what you actually go and get. Because oftentimes when things are brought to you, it's because somebody else didn't want it <laughs> or, uh, or they're trying to sell it. And so I always feel like going, you know, you, you got to be proactive versus reactive. And so we, we talk a lot about that. And then, you know, I, I, you know, one of my idols, my big idol, my, my younger daughter's name, Cal, his middle name's Callie after Cal Ripken. And you know, why do I love Cal? You know, why I was, you know, I got to meet him and, and we invested together in something but the, uh, but anyway, he came to work every day. He was incredibly diligent. He did things the right way. He was culturally, um, you know, I think morally incredibly sincere. And, um, you know, I really, really believe in that. And they, you know, you know believe in you do the right thing and you and, you know, I go to work every day. And, um, so I know that, that to me stands for a lot. And, and, uh, so I, you know, I think my kids yeah, he, are, I he's the one who, who played something like 2,600 games in a row. Right. So it's very much that, that ethic of showing up, doing your work and hoping that over the long run, if you're doing it right, if you, if you, if you do it right, lots of little times, I, I mean, in a way, in a way it goes back to the casino lesson, yes, sort of the golden nugget. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, so you think about it, it's almost, it's, it's physically impossible. It'll never happen again that somebody could, could literally not, you know, play sick, play hurt and do it every same. I mean, think about how extraordinary that is. I mean, even just, you know, you get, you set up, you have to have some good luck. So as you did, you know, crash into a player or what have you, but you know, this idea that, that, um, you could just, you could come in every day and operate at an incredibly high level is, is, uh. I, mean, I think it's extraordinary. I don't think we'll ever see that again. I mean, there are levels of it, but I don't think we'll, I don't think we'll ever see that again. But yeah, no, that, that, um, you know, watching that guy for a long time was, uh, was, was, uh, I, I thought amazing. Like, I thought that was historic. We get to watch, I got to go to the game where he broke Luke, Luke Gehrig's record. And I, you know, I thought it was the greatest sporting event of all time. Like how did, how did this guy do that? And, uh, so it was very cool. Being unbelievably emotional. And you have his jersey in your office, right? It is the, it is the, uh, it is the epicenter of my office and they, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, you know, I have a signed Jersey of his, and then like I said, we got, I got to know him and, and like I say, you know, he bodies everything that I, you know, I was believing. Like I watch, I watch, you know, even when you play golf, like how do you treat the people around you and have you, and he, you know, I got to do that with him, but, uh, but yeah, no, I think he's, I think he was pretty extraordinary. I, I have a, f a friend who, who works for your firm, who is the guy who introduced us, um, Thomas Muller Borgia, who we, I, I asked him about questions the other day and I, I, that I should ask you. And one thing he, he, he mentioned 
uh, since it's nice and uh, I, I'm sure he won't <laughs> mind me mentioning it to you. He said, you know, you're known as being really nice to the people in your team. Like you're very approachable, very friendly. And, and one of the things he was saying to me is he's really interested in your management style because given the intensity of what you have to do and the amount of responsibility, like how did you come to that philosophy of like, ob obviously you have to hold people to a high standard and yet you're being very nice to them. You're very approachable. Like, is that, can, can you talk a little bit about like your management sure. style? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I've hopefully I've tried to, you know, particularly on weekends, is try to be somewhat respectful or very respectful of people's time and and that, you know, everybody's different and everybody works work in different schedules. The nice thing about having a bunch of people on the team is like somebody may be around on Saturday morning from 7 to 10 and somebody else may be around Sunday afternoon. So try and be respectful of their time and, uh, you know, and by the way, they have personal commitments, et cetera. But, you know, I do believe in this idea that you know, this work hard thing. And that if, um, you know, as long as, but people have different schedules and those are providing them flexibility. And as long as, you know, varying levels of intensity, all I care about is that you're, you're, you know, you're proud of what you did and you're proud of the work that you're doing and that you're, con and that you're contributing to it. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm just not great. You know, people produce stuff that, that is, you know, not, you know, not efficient, not, not, um, not well done or not well researched. I'm respectful of people's time, but, you know, when, when asked to, um, you know, at, at whenever fits them, whenever asked to do it, you know, appreciate that people put in, you know, really excellent work and, uh, you know, they are proud of them. You go to a client and, you know, their, you know, their money and how, and what you're doing for them is to me is like sacrosanct. And is, you gotta, you gotta do things in a professional manner for them. So that's all I ask of people. And, uh, so. do you think at a certain point, it, it, it's, it sounds like a lot of your career, particularly the early years, but maybe later as well, you were motivated by this kind of terror of failure and becoming mediocre and, and, and letting people down. I'm wondering if at a certain point that shifted for you ever, and it became more about serving people, or if you're still really, you know, no. motivated by that terror and fear of failure. No, I don't, I don't, you know, even when you do, I, you know, I do it tons of, including today, tons of client presentations that you know, I think you got one shot and, you know, I, you know, I really, really am motivated by if you, if that presentation, you know, I saw like today people say like that was, you know, somebody said it was the best presentation I ever saw, I don't know whether it was, I don't know, they were, may probably be nice, but anyway, I really am motivated by that. Like, I, I really like when people say like you put in the effort and, and the work product was, was, was awesome. And, um, so anyway, you know, I, I still don't like, you know, if I come out of a presentation and I sort of laid an egg. You know, I find that incredibly disappointing. So no, I still am. I still feel like I'm going to get fired every day, and um, so I don't know. I just I don't know that that's ever going to change. In in the equation you talked about before, work hard, play hard, give back, reboot. Obviously, the giving back has actually been really central to your life, and I I know that for about 19 years you've been chair of the board of um, North Star Academy, this this system of what's now 14 charter schools in in New, New Jersey started out as, uh, as just one school. And, and it, I, I was looking on their website last night and it's, it, it says it's New Jersey's number one highest performing public charter school. And it serves over five and a half thousand people and more than 99% of these North Star graduates have been accepted to college. It's very formidable. And I, I, I know it's been important to you that you bring your children to their graduation ceremonies and you sign off on every check that the school writes and stuff. Can you talk about why why this focus on urban education both in newark and also in in atlanta where you're very involved as well through emory and and this organization you set up there why why this is the choice like why it's such an important part of your life so you know it goes back to you know like we were talking about earlier like you know i had we had you know tougher i had a tougher upbringing socially or economically i should say and then, uh, and then, you know, went well, and then it went, then, you know, declined a bit. You know, I watched like the difference, like I, you know, I went to, you know, I went to different schools and I watched the difference when I, when I ended up going to a high performing school, like everything is put in front of you and every, I didn't really take advantage of it so a lot, but every advantage you could have. And it was almost, you're in this pipeline of going to college and then getting to the next job and, you know, probably you had a family relationship that got you into the right job. If you're on the other side of it, you have no chance. 
And the, um, you know, you don't get all those benefits. You don't get all those contacts. And it's, I, I just, I've always felt it's an extraordinary injustice. And there is, you know, my schools in Newark and the, um, you know, the, the dynamic around, um, these kids are going to college and they're succeeding and they're going to, I, you know, the top schools in the country and, and, you know, I've hired a bunch of them and it's unbelievable, you know, what they, what they are accomplished. Same thing in Atlanta, there are graduation generation program. You know, it's pretty extraordinary what, you know, and I, I just think in this country, in the, in the world, but certainly, you know, what I focus on in this country is the ability to provide, you know, these people the opportunity. And I think it, you know, I think our education system in many ways is broken. And I think, you know, whether it's healthcare, social work, tutoring, you know, that, you know, a lot of these people don't have. And if you, if you give them the environment around it, you can, you know, there's a incredible unlocked economic and social uh, success that can come on the backside of it. And I just think, quite frankly, I think it's, I think your, your, your moral responsibility uh, is, is to, uh, is to do that. But you're being summoned. Is that because you've got to go to a plane? Yeah. Yes. As a matter of fact. <laughs> All right. Um, you, you want to get that for a second? Can you give me just one, one quick second? Yeah. 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 Go for one it. One quick second. Are you okay for half a minute longer? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, so we just had a very quick hiatus because Rick has to go get a plane. Um, is is there any, just to end, is there any specific story of someone where you've seen some kid whose life has just been transformed by this that that gives us a sense of wh- why this is such a, a life-enriching mission? Many, but I, the, the, I will tell you the one, I would say maybe the one experience that, I, that, I, that, I, that I've had is uh, so much at North Star, you know, when we have what's called College Signing Day, and we have all our kids, all our juniors come into the, into this huge arena and they, um, and the students, uh, and the juniors are all there supporting the seniors who are graduating and then all the parents and, uh, and, you know, related family or intermediate families are in the, in the arena. And these kids come up and they say, going to this university full ride. And then the place goes crazy. And you realize that people haven't had, you know, many of them is first generation that have gone to college and they're getting a full ride, you know, oftentimes getting a full ride or getting a lot of scholarship money. Like that is game changing. I've had my kids come to that. Like that to me is like, it makes the, I can't, you know, it's hard emotionally to keep it together when you see, when you watch this and it, it is, it's pretty amazing. To the extent that you feel like, gosh, you're, you know, maybe making some small contribution. Um, that to me is like the, the greatest, the great, I, I, by the way, I don't go anymore because I can't, I, I have a reputation. And I can't hold it together in those things. So I, I still go to graduate. I go to all our graduations, but I can't go to that anymore because it's emotion, an emotional disaster for me. But they're uh, they're very cool, and uh, and you know to watch, you know, watch these kids do what they're doing, and then you know watch them succeed. Whether you know, however you define success, which I would argue is not economically for a lot of people, is emotionally or what they're contributing to society, et cetera. But that to me is like the coolest thing that uh, that you know that I've watched, I've gotten a chance to witness. Rick, that's a beautiful note on which ended. I don't want to be the one who makes you miss your planes. This has been an absolute delight, and I hope it's the first of multiple conversations because it's it's been a real joy to to meet you and chat with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. It's a real honor. I appreciate that. Ah, uh, it's a great pleasure. I'll let you go now. Take care. Thanks so much. I immediately started by saying to him, "I regard you as the grand master of stupidity reduction." I started to talk to him about this idea. I had decided was really the most central lesson I wanted to share about Charlie, which is that you want to focus not so much on being smarter, but on reducing standard stupidities, reducing common error, unoriginal mistakes, as he would put it, or asininities and inanities, because he always had this wonderful way with language. So I talked to him about why, why that was a sensible approach. And he said, look, it's just easier to identify what not to do than to identify what to do. 